Hi everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Update. This is the 14th of November. As always, we have the chapters, so you can jump to any particular update you care about the most. Obviously next week is Ignite, so there'll be tons of exciting stuff next week. And talking of exciting stuff, just before I was about to record this video, and the channel hit 350,000 subscribers. So a huge thank you to everyone. And we'll do a, an Ask Me Anything session in the next couple of weeks where we can all get to interact and have a bit of fun. Um, new videos this week, really just one video, but focused on something really important that I'm seeing over and over again, is what are some of the principles we need to think about when moving an application to the cloud or designing fresh for the cloud? So I want to just go over some of those things uh, in a video, and uh, hopefully that, that helps out. So on to what's new on the compute side. So we now have this idea of an AKS Azure Linux OS Guard in preview. So you can think of OS Guard as additional protection for the container hosts that are running the regular Azure Linux 3.0. Remember, Azure Linux 3.0 is already FedRAMP certified. So what this OS Guard adds in addition to that is it ensures things like only trusted binaries from signed sources can run. It locks down the user space from tampering. And if I then couple that with things like trusted launch, it ensures and attests to that entire boot integrity. Also thinking about those security and locking things down, AKS now supports the Flatcar Container Linux in public preview. Now, Flatcar is built on the idea that you have an immutable file system. So that's going to help ensure this very predictable node behavior by preventing any kind of unauthorized change and also simplifying the recovery if there are security incidents. And what this actually means is Flatcar becomes the OS that your container nodes run within the node pool. Now it is open source, so it is available across Kubernetes environments, uh, across clouds. If you're curious about it, go and look at flatcar.org where you can get more information. The AKS local DNS has gone GA. So this provides a DNS proxy capability on each node of my node pool. So it's gonna cache the responses I get to DNS requests and then service those DNS requests within the node. So if I'm a pod on the node, it will reduce the latency for those DNS requests. And also because it's caching and then servicing the requests, the load on upstream DNS servers will be reduced. Also, if there was a problem with the upstream DNS servers, well, it will continue to service those requests. So it's gonna help with a resiliency to that as well. It is a DNS proxy, so it's completely transparent to the application. There's nothing you have to change in your app. Now it does run as a local system service on the nodes, and I do have a set of configuration I can perform. So I can do things like changing the time to live, but also I can do things like changing the servicing of stale records. So a record that is normally past their time to live, I can opt to continue serving it for a period of time. The AKS Agentic CLI is available in preview. So this brings the ability for natural language interactions to your AKS environment. There's an AZ AKS agent command, and so it can help answer questions, help solve problems, provide guidance. Behind the scenes, it's integrating with the AKS MCP server. So remember, model context protocol is all about a standard way for AI applications and, and agents to add additional knowledge and tooling without you as the person writing the app or the agent having to really understand it reflects its capabilities that I can just pass through to the generative model. So it's gonna take advantage of that AKS MCP server. Um, I now have AKS schedule profile configuration available in preview. So basically I can customize the behavior of the scheduler, which is responsible for placing new pods on the available nodes. So I now have ability to customize that behavior. On the networking side. So finally, the app gateway for containers, which remember, isn't just a, a slightly different version of app gateway. It's got app gateway in the name, but it is built from the ground up specifically for container workloads and layer seven functionality. Well, now we have a web application firewall. So protection from those SQL injections, those cross-site scripting, scripting, all of those common things. I can now add that capability for my app gateway for containers. Azure Front Door Web Application Firewall JavaScript Challenge has gone GA. So the whole goal of this is it's an invisible layer of protection 
that can distinguish between legitimate users and let them in while it will block malicious bots. So it's different from a capture challenge, which requires the user to click a box or maybe do something. This just presents a challenge to the browser. The user will see a little pause. So, hey, we're checking if you're a human. The browser is computing a response to the challenge, but then it, it lets it pass through. Azure Firewall now has the packet capture feature available in GA. So I can trigger the packet capture through the portal or through PowerShell. It is not designed to capture everything that flows through. It's designed to capture a specific flow as part of some troubleshooting you're doing. So the capture will be getting, written to a storage account. I can configure the number of packets I want to capture up to, I think, 90,000. I can capture the time I wish to capture for up to 30 minutes. And then I pick the specific protocol, TCP flag options, the source destination IP, the destination port you have to capture on a specific set of ports. It can't just be all ports. And then it will capture that bi-directional traffic matching anything in the filters you specify. Um, the Azure Firewall also now has DNS flow trace logs available in GA. So that builds on the DNS proxy capability of Azure Firewall and will now log the associated requests. So the query types, the query domains, the response codes, the upstream DNS servers, the source and destination IP of requests, all of that information I may want for investigations, understanding what's going on, uh, I can now get that. And then Azure Virtual Network Manager, which remember, provides me that scalable, centralized management of all the virtual networks for its connectivity, the flow of traffic, user-defined routes, IP address management. Well, it has three different updates available. So pool association will now look at virtual networks not currently associated with an IPAM pool and recommend the most suitable based on prefix length, uh, et cetera. Peering compliance will now ensure that any peers created by Azure Virtual Network Manager cannot be modified or deleted outside of Azure Virtual Network Manager. And then for user-defined routes, there's now a use existing mode. So what that will do is the routes that it wants to deploy, it will add to the existing route table if there's one already associated with the subnet. So it won't remove the existing routes. It will only create a new one if there's currently no route table associated. That's a choice you have. You can still keep the existing behavior where it will create its own one and just replace what was there. On the storage side, so we now have object priority replication in GA. So this is about the object level replication that I can configure from a source storage account and container with a filter to a destination account. It's an asynchronous replication, which because it's asynchronous, there is no guarantee on the completion time. This is different from GRS or GZRS, where it's a set paired um, between regions. But now what I can do as part of the policy I create for that replication, I can opt to prioritize the replication of the traffic. So now I will get an SLA that 99% of the objects will replicate within 15 minutes. And I get advanced metrics about the state of the replication. So uh, what's the lag in a zero to five minute, a five to 10, et cetera, et cetera. Now there are exceptions to this. If the accounts are not in the same continent, this doesn't apply. Objects larger than five gigabytes, it doesn't apply. Very large storage accounts in capacity or number of objects. So there are caveats, read the documentation. But I can enable and disable as required. It's an option in, in the portal for the replication rule. And also PowerShell, CLI, I can do it as well. And obviously there's an, an associated price with this. Leading on from this, GRS and GZRS now have the same option for priority replication. So obviously the difference here is GRS and GZRS uses the paired regions and it, it's the same storage account. But now what I can do is that same idea of, hey, 15 minute, 99% of the data replicated for block blobs only, not other types of blob. I can enable it at creation time and post-creation. So it's just if you go to the data management redundancy, there's a geo priority replication. And obviously I can disable it the same way. And again, there's a per gigabyte associated priority cost. Uh, Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2 now has vaulted backup in GA. So the backup of the data is not now just part of the original storage account, the data lake. It will go and actually put it into the vault. So by putting it into a separate vault and storage area, I get additional resiliency. 
but I can also then take advantage of the backup vault capabilities. So long-term backup up to 10 years, multi-user authorization. So a single malicious backup admin, if that credential was compromised, couldn't remove my backups. Uh, flexible backup schedules and a, a whole bunch of other stuff. On the database side, so PostgreSQL Flexible now can use all three availability zones in Japan West. And now there is open Cypher support for the KQL graph um, semantics that we can leverage with Fabric Event House and Azure Data Explorer. Now remember, graph semantics is all about relationships or edges between the various entities, nodes that exist. So so-and-so is a manager of this other entity or so-and-so works in a building. And so OpenCypher, which is an open source specification for querying graph databases, helps us interact with those graph semantics. What's really cool about OpenCypher is the way it works, the pattern matching is like an ASCII art style. So I create arrows between things. So, hey, there's maybe I want to match on a person, dash, the relationship, dash, end arrow, another person, for example. So I describe the relationships I'm looking for in this ASCII art style, and then it will return me those results. Um, we now have labels in the KQL graph semantics in GA. So I'm using Azure Data Explorer. I can now easily retrieve, filter, project labels on the nose and edges, the things we just talked about. And MySQL Flexible now has a lowercase table names uh, parameter. I did not know really what that was, but essentially this is a big deal. So during the instance creation, it's at creation time, it's gonna control how table names are actually stored and compared. For example, if I want to preserve the case of tables, but still compare with case insensitivity, I can now do that. Previously, tables did not maintain case. They were all stored lowercase. But now if I want to, I cannot to preserve the case. And then MySQL now has Azure Functions triggers. So uh, there's uh, creation, update, deletion of a row in a table. It can go and trigger an Azure function. So, hey, I want to be able to respond to those types of event in my MySQL database. I can now use the serverless Azure Functions to go and do some piece of code. Miscellaneous. So Azure Migrate now includes security insights to help assess potential existing risks you have in your workload and then how we could actually mitigate them via recommendations uh, during the migration. This is not Azure, but .NET 10 is out. There's a whole bunch of improvements across the board. And then GPT 5.1 was just announced. And again, the partnership between Microsoft and OpenAI, it is now already available in Azure AI Foundry. So the big deal here is GPT 5.1 is de designed to deliver better adaptive stepwise reasoning. And it's gonna adjust its approach based on the complexity of the task. And that can include chain of thought in the chat model for the first time. So obviously there's just the regular GPT 5.1 model. Um, generally, we're going to use that for regular AI applications, analytics, research, reviews, consolidating documents. It's generally that model of choice for high reliability, high impact. It is available as both global standard and also data zone for US and EU. Then we have the GPT-51 chat, which again has the new chain of thought for the first time. So that's going to be used for those interactive assistants, product user interfaces, and Again, if I want that adaptive reasoning for complex cases, uh, this can now do that. Now, this is only available as standard global. And then the GPT-51 Codex and GPT-51 Codex Mini, it, it's designed for those obviously agentic coding, enhanced tooling, refactoring, and I would use the Mini model for a more cost-effective option. And then finally, there is a new Atlanta AI Super Factory data center. So this joins Wisconsin as the second Fairwater AI super factory. And the whole goal here is it's, it's a near zero water use. The cooling is closed loop. So you're not having to add additional water into it. And it uses a new two level design. So I can have a denser GPU density. And also because they're compacted closer together, there's a lower latency between them. But it also has a new type of network linking the two locations together. So I can actually think about having a multi-site AI capability. 
So it's really focused on AI model training and inferencing uh, at really uh, at a scale previously unheard of. And that was it. Uh, as always, I hope that was useful. Till next video, take care.